and uh, social media coordinators for Quest Trust Company. Uh, today, we have a wonderful presentation by Devin Elder. Um, he is the co-founder of Apartment Educators, and he's going to be sharing a presentation on um, the best, uh, what is it, the best kept secret in real estate, which is apartments. So before we get right into the meat of the presentation, I'm going to talk for like five minutes or so. Um, and the first thing I'm going to say is uh, we have our sponsor who is not currently here, but I'm just going to go ahead and mention them. Uh, Real Estate IQ is, uh, you know, your number one place for lead generation. So Quest Trust Company doesn't give any tax, legal or investment advice, but, um, you know, they are our sponsor. So make sure that you look up Real Estate IQ um, and, you know, we'll go in real quick. Let me share my screen. Okay. So we're just going to get, you know, just talk about Quest just a little bit, just to kind of let you guys know if you're new or if you just need a refresher who exactly we are and what we do. So first, thank you for joining us for Self-Directed IRA Saturday. Uh, we love doing these kinds of webinars weekly for you guys. These seem to be the most popular ones. Um, so this is going to, you know, this is just always really exciting. Let me see. Oops. So first, who is Quest Trust Company? We are the largest self-directed IRA custodian in Texas, one of the definitely the fastest growing in the nation. We have about 20,000 active investors, uh, clients just like across the country. So it's not just in Texas, where's where we're located. It's all across the country and in some other uh, countries as well. We have about two billion in assets under management. About, I think it's really now more like a 110 employees and we have about 30, uh, 34 certified IRA professionals. We take training our people very seriously. I am among one of those certified IRA professionals. Got my um, certification last December, um, actually a year ago today from the American Banking Association. So woohoo. Um, and we have about uh, 350 million Un, in undirected cash as well. But again, Quest Trust Company, we are just a self-directed IRA custodian that just allows you to utilize your retirement accounts um, or other people's retirement accounts to purchase things like real estate um, and you know other alternative investments. However, we don't give any tax, legal, or investment advice. We're really just here to educate everybody. Um, so Quickly, what is a self-directed IRA? I'm gonna keep this one real simple. It's not a special type of account. The term self-directed is really just a marketing term. Um, the only real difference between a self-directed IRA and an IRA, and an IRA that you would traditionally think like at a public custodian, like a traditional IRA Roth IRA is what you can invest in. So it's really just the opposite side of the same coin. At a place like Quest Trust Company, you'd be able to utilize your IRA, your 401k to purchase alternative investments like real estate. So that's really the only difference. At Quest, there are seven different types of accounts that we have here. Traditional IRA, Roth IRA, all of your employer plans, your specialty accounts. So the health savings account can be used to pay for it. Um, so we'll just kind of breeze right through that. Um, so here are all the investment choices that you could possibly do. And today's, you know, is really more about apartments. So that's also something that you can do in a self-directed IRA. Um, and, you know, a very popular one nonetheless. So, you know, you can invest in real estate, private entities such as LLCs and, you know, lending out money like promissory notes uh, secured by real estate. Um, it's really easy to open up the account. All you got to do is open up the IRA, fund the account with like a transfer uh, from another IRA, a rollover from a 401k, or even just simply making a contribution to the IRA. Um, locating your investment, you know, coming to um, networking events like this, working with people like Devin um, and, uh, you know, just, just basically just meeting other people can help you locate your investments. Once you find it, done your due diligence, complete those investment forms um, with Quest, you know, we help you through that. And then your investment gets funded within 24 to 48 hours. So very all simple process, you know, we kind of hold your hand throughout the way when it comes to actually funding the investment and do a lot of education. Um, okay, that was really fast, um, but two announcements at this point. Make sure you mark your calendars for December 12th, 10 a.m. to 12 p.m. Central Time. We have a very special uh, panel for you. Um, we've never done something like this before, really, but we have, uh, it's a forecasting 2021 
um, panel with Eddie Wilson, Richard Wilson, and our very own president, Nathan Long, over the economic trends and investing insights from experts. So this is a forecast of the 2021, um, what you could use for tomorrow's strategies. Uh, I'm very excited about this one. So Evan's going to put the link below for you to RSVP to this event because it's completely free. So why not, right? Um, and then last but not least, I have this special for you guys. If you have a child or grandchild um, and you are, you know, who want who like for educational expenses, why would you want to pay that out of pocket when you can pay it with like an account like in Coverdell Education Savings Account? Completely tax free. That's right. So um, you can use a education savings account exactly like an IRA, use it for real estate, use it for, uh, you know, apartment um, investing, all that fun stuff. And you can use those ex expenses today for your child or grandchild. But we have a special Christmas um, like gift going on right now. If you open up a Coverdell education savings account in the month of December, um, we have a really adorable little gift package for uh, that will come with each ESA. So each uh, child gets like this activity book that was designed, a certificate, some swag, a little Quest um, toy, a little Quest plushie doll. These, those are super cute. So that comes with every ESA that you open and you have to use the code gift ESA to receive that and we'll mail it right to your house. So it's really cute. I've seen the book. Um, I've helped kind of design the package. And so I'm really excited about it. I hope you guys are too. Um, but ooh, there we go. That's all I have really for you guys before we get into the presentation. Remember, if you want, I went kind of fast with the presentation. So email IRA specialist at questtrust.com if you want to set up a consultation with an IRA specialist such as myself, um, or you want to find out more about the, uh, the event we have in December 12th or the Coverdell um, activity book gift package that's super cute. Um, so make sure you give us an email or, or, um, or you know, call us at 855-FUN-IRAs. And without further ado, I'm going to stop talking and sharing my screen. And Devin, you have the floor for the next hour. Guys, uh, we're going to do Q&A at the end. So make sure that um, you know, you're know you saving your questions. You're putting it in the Q&A box. You're putting it in the chat. And then we will ask those questions to Devin at the end of the presentation. So I'm going to put myself on mute, get rid of my video. And you have the floor, Devin. Excellent. Nicole, thank you so much. Appreciate that. And hello, everyone. Happy Saturday to you. My name is Devin Elder. We're going to talk about apartments today. I'm going to share my screen here in just a minute. But just to kind of underscore what Nicole had said, if you look at the bottom of your screen, kind of on the right, there's a Q&A. You'll see two little chat boxes there. Um, throughout my presentation, as questions occur to you, just throw them in there. You know, we're going to answer them all at the end. I love q and I want to save a lot of time for it. It's kind of my favorite part of these types of presentations. You guys can keep me on my toes. And um, the, the floor is wide open in terms of questions. But uh, you can just throw them in as they occur to you, as I'm going through the presentation, if you want some clarification on something. And then we'll get to all those questions at the end. So use that Q&A box um, throughout the entire presentation. So I'm going to share my screen now. And we're going to talk about a presentation here called the best kept secret in real estate investing. Um, and we call it that because a lot of people take a long time from their initial foray into real estate investing to actually um, getting into apartments. And, and it sometimes can take people a while to, uh, to find apartments once they've, once they've started, they spend a lot of time, myself included, I spent years going through wholesaling and flipping and rental houses and things like that, things like that before getting into apartment investing. So that's what we're going to talk about today. This is actually one of our communities in San Antonio there in the background. This is a 268 unit apartment complex that we own. And um, let's kind of dive in here. The agenda for today's call uh, or for today's presentation, I'll just kind of touch on this briefly. I'll give you a little background on myself. Uh, we're going to go over the best kept secret in apartments. We're going to talk about passively investing. And this is, if that's a new term to you, that's a very exciting concept because real estate is a lot of work. Uh, you know, I don't, I don't care what, it, what anybody tells you. There's a lot of, there's a lot of moving parts, a lot of variables, and it's a lot of work. You as an investor, especially with IRA funds, you don't necessarily have to do all that work right? You can let your money work for you. 
by partnering with somebody that's got the system set up to do the work. So that's a very enticing investment option is passive investing. And it works perfectly with, with self-directed IRAs. Um, we're going to talk about the structure of deals. You know, I, I'm in deals all over the country as a passive investor myself. I am a sponsor, meaning that I run uh, uh, hundreds of units here in Central Texas uh, as an operator. And you'll see a lot of similarities between the, the way the deals are structured. So I want to introduce you to the, the typical deal structure and how our firm does it, just to give you some ground uh, some groundwork there. We're going to talk about uh, returns that we often target for these types of projects. I'm going to talk about how to find an investment. This is a property right here, a drone uh, shot of one of our properties in San Antonio, Texas on the northwest side. Um, nice, nice little uh, aerial shot there. So we'll talk a little bit about apartment educators real quick. So I'm uh, the co-founder of Apartment Educators. I founded this with my business partner, Ruben Dominguez. And we came together because for years I'd been getting uh, requests for training and coaching and things like that around investing in apartments. And I was, I was so busy running my own business that I, I just didn't have time uh, to do that. I, I, I wanted to help people. I wanted to try and coach people. And I love helping take people kind of the next level in their investing career. But I was already busy running my own company, buying our own deals, taking care of our own investors. So we partnered up. Ruben is essentially, uh, you know, runs the operations for the company and I come in and do some coaching and speaking and things like that. And, and we kind of wear different hats, but um, it's been fantastic opportunity to really put together a proper training and coaching and ecosystem of vendors and partners and connections where people that want to invest in apartment complexes, either passively or as a lead sponsor can come in, join apartment educators and get plugged in. And I, and I call it kind of a fast forward button, right? You can learn all this stuff. I mean, um, something I like to say here, everything's out there on the internet for free, right? I host a podcast. There's a million real estate podcasts. You can go learn all the terminology about all this stuff on your own. And, and I encourage you to do so. However, you know, if you're going to go out and actually put your own money at risk or even bigger, put take investors on and go do your own deal, you, you really do need coaching. And the, the parallel that I like to draw is um, I wanted to learn to fly a helicopter. So I bought some books and I started looking at online courses and there's all the information online that you need to go and take uh, the, F, the, the FAA written exam, right? But you wouldn't in a million years think that you're going to learn everything you need to know from watching online videos, go fly a helicopter, right? You, you, that'd, be, that'd be lights out for you. So I hired a coach. I hired an instructor. I see him three times a week. I pay him a good amount of money so that he can train me how to do this very specific thing of flying a helicopter, right? So I need both. I need the book education and I needed to hire a coach in order to go do this task. So I think about apartment educators the same way. We have lots of free content. We, we have uh, lots of, lots of uh, resources for people. I encourage people, uh, you know, all you guys listening, if you want to learn more about investing, go listen to podcasts, et cetera. But at some point, it makes sense to hire a, a coach and get plugged into an ecosystem too. You can learn more about that at apartmenteducators.com. This is us here with some of our students at, uh, at one of our recent events. So let's get in a little bit about my background. Um, my name's Devin Elder. I was born and raised in San Antonio, Texas, is where I reside with my wife of 12 years and our, our three kids. Um, I had a fairly typical route of growing up, going to college and going to work for a large employer here in, in San Antonio. And I, um, I was pretty excited about it for the first couple of years. Uh, great employer and working really hard and, and trying to kind of climb that corporate ladder. But after a few years, I um, realized that I would get a little promotion, but then it would take a, it would take more time and be more stressful. And I just kind of fundamentally ran into a math problem in my day job, which was if I wanted a two X or five X or 10 X, my income, um, I couldn't do that within the framework of that W two job. You know, it would have taken, it would have taken years and years and years and years to do that. So, uh, I started looking for alternatives and real estate, you know, was is kind of the one. If you search for any amount of time on building wealth, it doesn't take you very long before you stumble upon real estate in some form or fashion. What I found throughout my years of investing is people either made their money in real estate 
or they made their money elsewhere and they bring it to real estate. That's a pattern I see over and over and over and over again. And people like real estate for the cash flow, the fact that it's a real asset, it's tangible, et cetera. Um, so I became an entrepreneur in real estate many years ago. I flipped hundreds of houses and now I'm a principal in over 2,000 doors of of uh, multifamily in Texas. So we own many apartment complexes uh, in San Antonio, Texas, and we're kind of always buying and selling these projects. And uh, it's great business to be in. Uh, it's what we call a win-win-win business, right? Our firm can win, our investors win by getting great returns back by an asset, and then our residents win because we go and we, we put a lot of money into these projects to improve them. So why am I here at this event spending time with you guys on Saturday? Um, everything that's happened for me in my career as a real estate investor, as an entrepreneur, has been a result of a relationship, right? Early on, it was me um, seeking out mentors and developing relationships with people, with people that were further down the road than I was. And since then, it's been relationships with vendors, relationships with investors, relationships with our coaching students now. So the whole thing is a, is a relationship-based game. And, that, and I want to kind of highlight the win-win uh, nature of it. When you set up a scenario um, or a business structure where all the parties win, makes it real easy to go do that again, right? This is a long-term business that we're in. This is a relationship-based business. We're not here to do a project and, and make a quick buck at somebody's expense. We're here to do big projects that make money for everybody involved and, and, and everybody involved can't wait to go do another deal. We can't wait to go do another deal. Our investors can't wait to do another deal. The vendors that, that we pay a lot of money to on these renovations and things, they can't wait for us to do another deal. The brokers, the lenders, everybody involved, right, wants to do these deals. And so um, that's what you'll find kind of in the multi-family multifamily investing world is that, that um, it's everybody's kind of playing the long game and it's very relationship based versus uh, transactional, which you might see in kind of the single family world or wholesaling or flipping houses, very transactional. Multifamily is very relationship based. So I'm here because I'm always building relationships. I'm always meeting new people. Uh, everybody that you meet knows something you don't, right? Whether they're a successful CEO or it's somebody working at a restaurant you're at, that person knows something you don't know. And so that kind of take that approach to, to everything I do throughout my interactions. I always want to learn um, something that I don't know from, from somebody new. And hopefully I'm able to add some value to people that I meet as well. So that's, what, that's why I'm here. So we'll talk about the best kept secret, apartments. Um, some misconceptions here. Don't big companies own apartments? Before I started buying apartment complexes or even got introduced to the concept, uh, I thought huge companies on Wall Street owned these big apartment complexes in my town. And some of them do, right? There's some, there's some real estate investment trusts or large insurance companies, et cetera, that own some of these projects. But if you drive around really any big city in the country and you see large apartment complexes, a lot of those are simply owned by a group of people. And sometimes those people are not, uh, you know, uh, centimillionaires, you know, worth $100 million, right? They're just folks that put together fifty dollars or $100,000. A group of them came together, uh, you know, a number of families go out and purchase this, this project and run it for a profit. So uh, that's called a syndication. We'll talk about that a little bit more. But just think of it as a, as a group of folks going out to do a bigger deal than they could do on their own, right? So rather than somebody buying one house, a group of families can get together and purchase a big apartment complex. And so not all the apartment complexes are owned by some big company, uh, you know, big private equity firm out of New York City or whatever. A lot of them are owned by just a group of regular folks. Um, another conception, misconception maybe is around the, the amount of capital. It does take a lot of capital to get into apartments, but you don't have to necessarily, one person, have all the capital. You don't have to go out and write a $10 million check to buy an apartment complex, right? There's ways to structure this in a win-win fashion where everybody uh, involved in the project can benefit. And some people are bringing more labor to the deal. Some people are bringing more capital to the deal. And there's a nice way to structure these deals so that you don't necessarily have to be somebody that can write that a $10 million check or something big like that to get into a multi-million dollar apartment club complex. So for example, this uh, this community right here on this slide um, is an, a community we bought in 2019. This is a 20, you know, mid $20 million purchase, $25 million purchase on the uh, apartment complex. 
so we ran that deal, but you know, we didn't write the check for $25 million. We have obviously a lender and we have some investors and we put in some of our own capital, but we're able to go take down a really big apartment complex through a, through kind of a team sport approach. Another concept or misconception around apartments is that they're too much work. And I could say that sometimes if they're, if they're structured the wrong way, or if you're looking at smaller deals, those can be a lot of work. And for sure, the large apartments are a lot of work too, but you have the benefit of having an actual staff that works on site every day, full-time staff to do that day-to-day -day work. Uh, another misconception might be that the returns are, are too low. Now, if you're buying a brand new apartment building, that might be the case. Returns might be pretty low, but by targeting a certain type of asset class that we do, we're actually able to get some really attractive returns out of those apartments. So why apartments? A um, couple of reasons here, and there are many, but these are some of the big ones. Number one is, is the return on your capital. Um, any investing strategy really, uh, unless it's some kind of really aggressive strategy you're going after, should be first capital preservation. Don't lose money, right? You do not want to put $100,000 in a project, hope it goes up, but have the possibility of losing all of it, right? Now, any investment has inherent risks in it, and you shouldn't invest any any capital that um, that is not earmarked for investment, but you you want first to preserve your capital. But on top of that, you obviously want to make a good return as well. You know, if you're putting it in a CD or something like that, you're not going to get those great returns. You're also getting a tax benefit in many cases. Um, it's a safe asset. It's housing, right? I mean, this is such a fundamental product, and this was really underscored in 2020 with COVID when we saw so much. Um, tumultuousness in the markets. So many businesses are, are were impacted in such a negative fashion. Um, but our thesis has been for years that apartment communities will hold up well because they are a fundamental need. It's, it's really most people's biggest expense, their, their monthly rent or mortgage payment. And it's in many cases, their most important expense. I mean, in some cases, people could get by without a vehicle. They could cut back all kinds of other expenses, but people need a place to live. It's such a fundamental uh, service. And that's why we like it, because it's not some frivolous service uh, that people are going to cut when they when they have to tighten the, the belt. It's, this is a, a very critical thing to have some place to go home and go to sleep every night. So housing is, is very important. And then it's also safe in terms of being a real tangible asset. It's piece of dirt. It's a building. It's an income stream. It's all those things, very tangible. It's why the banks will give us 70 to 80% of the purchase price, right? If, we're, if you're buying a $10 million building, the bank will gladly loan you $7 million at a very favorable interest rates. You're not going to see that in a single family house and you are going to buy it and renovate it and maybe refinance it. You can create some, some excellent returns, uh, but you have to factor in what your time is worth. And so if you're working for free on your rental house uh, and, you, and let's say you've got a six figure job as a, as a W2 employee, and then you're working nights and weekends on your rental house, well, you need to factor in your compensation because that's not free, right? Just because you're doing all the work on your rental house um, and then saying, oh, I'm making all these profits. Well, you are, but if you were to pay yourself a fair market value for your, for your labor, um, the returns aren't going to be as good. So single family is great. I love it as an asset class. Uh, I still have, I don't know, probably a dozen single family rentals that I'll probably keep for forever and give to my kids. Uh, I've actually started handing off on their birthday. They get a, they each get another rental house. So the, I'm kind of slowly giving, turning my, uh, rental houses over to my children so that they can kind of learn this, uh, real estate investing thing as they grow up. But, um, but single families work, right? If you're a landlord, uh, if you're going to manage a rehab, that is work. And if you're going to um, do it yourself, you need, you need to be cognizant of what your time is worth and what that's costing in the project. So a, a passive investing in apartments is re really zero work other than education. You need to get educated and you need to understand who you're investing with. And so there's going to be some due diligence and work on your part up front. Uh, but then after that, after you've done some due diligence and invested with a sponsor on a deal, there's there's literally no work for you to do, which is really very attractive. I am a passive investor in many, many projects, and I love it because I know once I invest, 
I know that sponsor's got a lot of hard work to do and I don't have to do any of it. And I'm happy that they get their share and I get my share because I don't have to do any of the work. Another thing that lets me do and lets any passive investor do is scale, right? You could be in multiple passive investment deals, put some money in this deal, put some money in this deal, in this deal, in this deal. And it doesn't take any more work. You know, if you're passive in one deal or you're a passive investor in 10 deals, other than just kind of keeping track of your investments and, and your paperwork and stuff like that, there you're not having to go on site. You're not having to hire anybody. You're not having to make any lending decisions. You're not having to do any of that stuff, uh, which is really nice and lets you scale a lot easier uh, and faster than with single family houses, which are a lot of work. Great investment, but a lot of work. So I've been talking about passive investing. I want to kind of dive into that a little bit more here. Some of the things we like um, is the cash flow. So this is per project, and this is, can depend. I don't want to say every apartment project is like this, but there's a common profile that you're going to see in multifamily investing, and uh, they, they tend to look kind of very similar. So a lot of times there's a cash flow component. This is real spendable cash in your account every month or every quarter. Right. And so that, that's fantastic. So, you know, I've got a, uh, some stock investments uh, and they go up, they go down, but they don't send me any money. That's for sure. Right. I don't get a dividend off a of Tesla stock or Apple stock. Right. It might go up and it might go down. And I may lose all of it. You know, it's, it's completely out of my control. I certainly don't know the owners um, or have a personal relationship with the owners or, or the, the executive team at Apple or Tesla, for example. Right. I just kind of put my money in and, and, and pray. Really, that's really kind of it's gambling strategy is what it is, right? But um, and it's certainly not paying me a dividend every month or every quarter. Well, a lot of times multifamily investments are set up to send out a, a monthly or quarterly distribution, which is a very nice component of real estate investing. So you kind of have the best of both worlds. You could put in some capital into an investment, maybe with an IRA or with cash or with a with a company or whatever, however you want to fund it. Put some money in. Enjoy some cash flow along the way. And then all the while, the, the sponsor is doing some work to create uh, more value in that property. And you're going to see appreciation over time. And then at some point down the line, sell the property, get your investment back, plus some additional gains. So you kind of get the, the best of all worlds here in that you've got some cash flow while you're holding the asset. And you've got appreciation. And at some point, you know, you, you basically get to milk the cow for several years. And then at some point you, you take the cow to slaughter and get all of your, your uh, gains at the, at the end. So you kind of, you get both best of both worlds. You don't necessarily have to wait for the whole project to conclude in order to be uh, to, 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 to see some benefit and see some gains. So equity is one of those components, right? So cash flow is nice. And then it shows up in your bank account every month. Uh, but equity is also an important component. So you know, what happens when we've got a, a apartment complex valuation up here and a loan balance, right? Let's say the apartment's worth 10 million and the loan balance is 7 million. You got $3 million of equity there. Well, over time, and this works just the same as a, as a, as a house, right? Let's say you have a rental house. Well, over time, if, if in three years it's worth 11 million and you've paid your loan down to 6 million, now you have a much bigger equity. Right. So you started with three million and now in a couple of years, you're at five million dollars equity. Right. So the valuation has gone up. Uh, you might have paid the loan down some and, and the, the properties appreciated some. And so that equity goes up. And over time, that grows and grows and grows in, in real estate. While it's certainly not straight linear up and to the right, it tends to increase in value over time because it's they're not they're not making any more land and we're creating value in these projects. So. You've got um, your equity growing over time in these projects, which is which is really nice. You've also got potential tax benefits. I would recommend you talk with your CPA on the best way to take advantage there. But there are tax benefits in real estate that are um, extremely helpful for some folks, especially high W-2 earners. And then we're, we're talking about why invest passively here, right? There's no work for investors. And I touched on this earlier, but if you're a passive investor... Um, you've got some work to do in terms of your education and in terms of your due diligence with your sponsor. And the sponsor is just the person running the deal, right? Usually in these bigger projects, you've got a, a person or a company running the whole thing. And then you've got investors that are really kind of think of as silent partners, right? They don't have to do any work. They're just putting in some capital. But once you've identified somebody that you want to invest with and done some due diligence on them, 
there's there's really no work after you fund the project, um, which again, I, I alluded to that earlier, but this, this can scale very cleanly because you can be in multiple projects. Uh, I was just looking at a list I have of all my past investments today. And some of them I haven't, you know, I haven't done a thing on in a couple of years because I put the money in, forgot about it. Uh, other than some accounting, when the cash flow distributions come in, there's, there's really nothing to do. Just kind of kick back and wait. Now, that may sound oversimplistic, but that's that's literally it. You put your money in and kind of forget about it and wait for the sponsor to do all the work, wait for appreciation um, and continue to get your cash flow checks along the way. It's a pretty nice setup and very truly passive. So I've heard you know, rental houses uh, described as passive income. And I, I completely disagree, right? If you're a landlord on a rental house, that, that's not passive income, right? Because there's, there's still a lot of things that you're responsible for. Uh, as a passive investor in an apartment project, it really is um, truly passive, which is which is a nice benefit. Okay, so let's, let's get into the, the nuts and bolts of a structure of a apartment deal, right? What, is this, what does this look like? You've got... Um, I'm going to kind of give you a high level structure that's that's fairly simplistic, but uh, it's kind of the baseline for what you'll see on a lot of different projects. So what happens is you've got an apartment community and the sponsor, again, this is the person running the project, will create or their attorneys will create a new LLC a lot of times. Right. And that LLC's only purpose in life is to buy and own that apartment complex. So. You got that LLC, it's buying this apartment complex over here, and you've got class A and B shares. Well, the A shares are for the investors, and the, a, the, the investors buy up the shares. The B shares are for the sponsor. And this is usually split 70-30, which is really favorable to investors, right? Investors own 70% of the whole project, and the sponsor owns 30% for doing all the work. So pretty, that's a pretty fair and equitable setup. To, to structure it that way, the investors own, um, you know, a majority of the project, 70%. So that's typically how it goes. There are certainly much more complicated uh, things that can happen here. You might see very complex type of deal structures. At our, for our investment firm, um, we keep it this simple. I mean, it's 70-30 split. It, investors have class A shares. We have class B. There's oftentimes preferred cash flow to investors. And what a preferred return is means that of all the profit the property produces, the investors get paid first. Oftentimes, this will be a six or seven percent preferred return to the investors first, and then everything after that is split 70 30. So, that's a pretty typical structure, which, which puts investors. Uh, puts investors first, and any good sponsor is always going to put investors first because they understand if they take care of their investors they will also benefit at some point and then they can go do more deals with those investors. So again, this is, I, I said it at kind of the top of the call here. This is a relationship business. This is not a transactional business. This is a long-term business, long-term relationships, and it behooves any sponsor to take care of their investors first uh, above and beyond any other concerns. And then they take care of the, themselves and their company second. So that's what a preferred return indicates. There is that the, the passive investors are getting paid out first, right? And then everything else is split 70-30, 70 percent to investors and 30 uh, percent to management. So let's say that uh, the preferred return was was paid out and the investors got their seven percent and then there's one dollar of additional profit. Well, of that one dollar, 30 cents goes to the management company or to the sponsor. 70 cents go to the investors. So that's typically how it goes. You'll see fees uh, in these types of deals. Usually there's a due diligence fee on the front end for the sponsor at closing, something to help them pay their payroll and, and their office expenses, et cetera. You'll often see an asset management fee ongoing for the sponsor. This is usually two or 3% of the uh, revenue. So they've got a little fee uh, during the whole life of the project. It's really not that much, but it's something, again, to help pay for uh, payroll, office expenses, et cetera. And then you may see a disposition fee on a project. You may not. It's, it's not as common. Um, and those are the typical fees. There's also going to be a, pro a property management fee in there on, on any project, whether the sponsor has the management company or whether they're using a third party management company. There's going to be usually a three or four percent fee to the management company. Uh, so those fees are common in pretty much any deal. 
what's what's important to understand about the fee structure is any and any any good sponsor is going to do this when they when you see return projections those are net of all fees so you you're not going to see a return projection of 15% and then you have to take out your fees out of that it's the, the all the uh, return projections to that are shown to a prospective investor will be net fees net of fees so the fees are already included in there so it shouldn't really matter um as a passive investor if the spot you know what the what the fee structure is as long as the return is acceptable to the passive investor right um the return targets that you're going to see a lot of times across multifamily deals really kind of nationwide are uh, the the sponsors are looking for an average return of 14 to 18 percent range so that's pretty good you know if you're putting in a hundred thousand dollars and you're seeing fourteen thousand dollars a year return on average on that throughout the life of the project that's a really really compelling return versus alternatives in the market especially given the the risk ad adjusted nature of it meaning that yes it's a good return but it's also a fairly safe and conservative investment because it's a housing and it's it's essential need it's uh tangible it's a real asset etc right so you've got some safety mechanisms built in inherently in real estate that you don't have in other asset classes i mentioned earlier we're looking for cash flow now the cash flow might um de vary depending per project but Ideally, you want to find a project that has cash flow of six to eight percent paying out while you hold it. Again, we've got the best of both worlds here. We've got cash flow while we're holding it. So we've got monthly or quarterly distributions coming out. And then we've got a gain at the end then when we when we recapture our equity. Right. So you, you will want to see cash flow of, uh, of six to eight percent. And then we're looking for an equity multiple of one point four to two percent. So equity multiple means if you put in a dollar. What do you get back at, after the whole project is done? So an equity multiple of 1.4, if I put in $100,000, I'm going to get back $140,000 over the life of the project. An equity multiple of two means if I put in $100,000, I'm getting out $200,000 over the life of the project. And so it gets pretty exciting if you were to say, hey, if you're in a position to invest in five passive deals over the next couple of years, $100,000 each, and those all do a 2x equity multiple. And you're looking at doubling that money over time, again, with no work on your part, right? Other than identifying the right deals and, and funding them, there's no work to be done. So that gets pretty exciting um, once folks have some investable capital. And, you know, I, one of the things uh, at the top of the call here that Nicole mentioned was that, that, that uh, Quest has $350 million of unallocated capital. That means they have $350 million sitting in their accounts that is not deployed. So that's a lot of investors with some IRA money that have not found a project or a home for it yet, right? So there's a lot of capital out there and your IRA uh, may be a source of investable capital that you hadn't looked at before, right? Maybe that's why you're here today because some people will say, well, this passive investment's got a $50,000 minimum, but you know, I don't have $50,000 cash in the bank, but you may have access to that via your IRA, right? So uh, sometimes that's a pool of capital people didn't even know they could invest with. When we look at our deals, we have between three and seven million dollars of in, of investor capital per project, and some of that is our invest our capital that we invest alongside with investors. But let's say you're looking at a five million dollar um, capital for an apartment building that we go out and buy. There might be a million of that. There might be a million and a half of that that's actually IRA money. So we'll see Quest. IRA forms come in and people will fund uh, the project with their with their IRA. So it's about 20, 25% of any given project of ours is folks using their IRA money. So really attractive um, bucket of cash that some people don't even realize that they that they can access for these type of investments. So that's what we look for for passive investors. An overall average annualized return of 14 to 18%, cash flow along the way of six to eight percent. And an equity multiple of 1.4 to two, right? Meaning we we take that money, um, you know, times 1.4 all the way up to two times, or, or sometimes better. That's what we're looking for as a return target for investors. So I've talked a lot about project sponsors, uh, and that just means the person or company that is going out and running these deals. It's important that you find a good one if you're going to invest your your hard-earned capital with them. 
Um, one way to do that is attend local meetups. Uh, 2020 has been a tough year for, for, for face-to-face meetings, but everybody's adapted. We've done a lot of online meetings. We're doing one here right now. And you can meet folks through these types of local meetups. We would say to join a multifamily group or RIA, that's a real estate investment association in your town, in your city. Um, And a lot of those have moved online as well, but that's a great place to start networking and hearing about sponsors. And then you can attend multifamily conferences. So those are plentiful, right? And that's when you go out and you get with like-minded folks that are also seeking sponsors, you're going to meet people that are a little, little further down the road and can, can provide some, uh, some guidance for you and, and even some camaraderie. I mean, this is a team sport. It's fun to go out and win together with a group of, of people um, on these types of projects. So you can start doing some research, meeting new sponsors, uh, attending meetups, multifamily groups, multifamily conferences, um, and do that that way. So how do you want to ensure that your money is invested safely, right? And there's a couple of things here to to just, this is basically like an introduction to this, but you want to check the sponsor's track record. You want to be sure that the sponsor is doing a deal that, that they've, that they've done before, essentially, right? They're doing a deal. Let's say we're going to go out and buy a 200 unit apartment complex in San Antonio. Well, this might be our 12th. I think this, I think we're buying our 13th deal this year before the end of the year. Right. So, you know, when, when a lender looks at us and an investor looks at us as an example, and they say, wow, this is your 13th deal, kind of similar to previous deals, same market, same team. You've done well on all the other ones. They feel pretty good about that. The lender feels pretty good and the investors feel pretty good too. So you want to, you want a sponsor that's done this kind of thing before, right? And then in terms of market, you want to look for job growth in that market. Right. So place, places where population is declining is going to be a bad place to invest. You want population growing. You want uh, the rents to be growing in that market. And then you want the net positive. Mi- you want net positive migration. So migration is always happening right in and out. Everybody's always coming in and out of San Antonio, in and out of Buffalo, New York, in and out of Las Vegas, whatever. But what does a net migration look like? You want the net to be higher. You want po- the city to be growing over time. More people coming in than are leaving. And that's what you want to look for is net positive migration. And then number five, you want to invest in B and C projects a lot of the time. And you don't always have to do this. These are just guidelines here, right? But by investing in B or C assets, what are these? These are typically 1970s, 1980s, 1990s vintage projects that have some sort of improvement component that you can go in, whether it's just uh, doing a little bit of an updating. And whereas if you're buying a, you know, a brand new apartment building that just got built, it's, the returns are probably not going to be that good. And that's what, you know, you see these big uh, insurance companies, for example, insurance company has a pension fund. They need to invest a billion dollars. Well, they're going to put it in very safe, brand new assets. Uh, all, us, kind of the smaller investors, we want to be a little bit more aggressive and say, hey, we want projects where we can create some value in there. And a lot of times that's these 1970s, 1980s, 1990s type of projects that are uh, able to do that, right? So those are some tips for ensuring your money's invested safely. Uh, Ultimately, you know, like any business adventure, you need to, you need to find the right partners, right? That's kind of the key to the the key to the whole thing. But you also want to be aware of these markets, these market components uh, as you're investing, Uh, job growth, rent growth, and population growth. Okay, so I want to save some time for some Q&A. So I've got about 15 minutes here. I want to talk a little bit about where to find us. You can go to apartmenteducators.com. DJE Texas is my company that I run. We're a private equity investment company. And I know we've got got some Q&A to jump into. So I'd like to get that started. I'll leave that slide up. And I think Nicole's jumping back on here as well. Right here. Um, okay. That that was really awesome. I was I was fully paying attention to that whole comp, like that whole presentation. Uh, very very good job. Um, we have a lot of questions actually. Um, so looks like the first one that I see from Kimberly Williams is how has your cash flow been affected by um, mor- morariums or on evictions due to COVID-19 and or tenants experiencing job loss? Yes, that's a great question. Uh, we get that question every presentation I do. Tenants definitely experiencing job loss, right? I mean, it, a lot of people have been impacted. 
the high level, and I'll start with this and then go into a little detail. The high level is our portfolio is performing um, about the same as it was last year. You know, we're in the mid 90s on occupancy. Collections are very good. A lot of that is because there's been some stimulus at the federal level. And then there's been in Bear County where we operate, there's $30 million that was uh, allocated for rent assistance. So we've seen some of those Bear County checks come through to help folks out. There are also kind of myriad programs available for rent assistance. Um, I think there's like a dozen of them that we share with with tenants that have been impacted so that they can get their rent paid. And all of that uh, alongside with very proactive on-site teams is um, you've got um, you've got a fundamental need of, of housing here and people tend to want to stay in their home and not leave unless they ha- absolutely have to. So certainly we've seen some impact, but in general, when you look at occupancy and collections, we've, we've really been... Um, very fortunate to be in this industry because there, there has been extremely minimal impact across the board, which we're very pleased with. Oh, good deal. Um, so sticking with the COVID discussion, we just have one more question involving that um, from Troy says, are you seeing more cash calls to investors since COVID? Should cash call expectations be discussed with the sponsor prior to investing? So I'll answer the second question first. Should cash call uh, be Should cash call addressed up front. Hundred percent. Yeah. If I'm a passive investor, I absolutely want to talk about that up front. Um, the way we handle it for our firm is we've never done a cash call and we never want to. I can't predict the future, but I, I absolutely that would be the last uh, imaginable resort for us to go back to investors. But it's happened before. I've been on. Ca- I've been in passive investor in deals where I've had to write some checks as a cash call. I don't like it at all, but it's happened before. Uh, not on the deals we run, though. So it's important for the sponsor to be well capitalized up front, and uh, it's important for you as a passive investor to understand what a cash call is. That's a great question. All right, good answer. Good answer. Okay, so. I might be able to kind of help answer this one, but uh, I have a couple people actually asking about uh, talking about unrelated taxable income and apartments. If you had any insight on that. I generally, and I hate to do this. I generally defer to an investor's CPA for that. Exactly. That's exactly what I was going to say, guys. uh, When it comes to unrelated uh, taxable income, um, it can, you know, particularly apply to things like apartment complexes and stuff like that. And we do see that a lot here, but uh, it is best to discuss that with your CPA. If you want um, more information on it, guys, make sure you check out our YouTube page. We actually have one or two videos with uh, our, uh, a Houston CPA, Adam Barr, who is an expert in UBIT tax. Um, um, did you close the Vizcaya apartment yesterday and still raising funds. How can I invest in Vizcaya? So I, I don't know if there's a forum to discuss a live deal, but we did we did uh, fully fund that project. But if you'd like to learn more about our firm, you can go to djetexas.com and we'd be happy to have a chat with you. Uh, let me see. Trying to find a good one. Oh, uh, what cities do you operate in? What class of apartments do you acquire? So for our firm, DJE, Texas Management Group, we are really, at this point in time, exclusively focused on San Antonio, Texas. We like B and C apartments. These are 1970s and 80s apartments for the most part. Okay, good deal. Um, Oh, I like this one. So Greg says, what is the difference between AAR, average annualized return, and ROI, return on investment, or APR, annual percentage of rate? So just like a differentiation question. Yeah. No, I love it. So APR, you, you see a lot with like a credit card, right? Mm-hmm. So if your APR on a credit card is 10%, um, then the credit card's making 10% average annualized return off of you, right? So you, usually we don't see APR thrown around a lot in the apartment investing space. So I'll talk about AAR, uh, average annualized return. And I think, was this Mark? Okay, there it is, Greg. Um, average annualized return means what did, what did the whole thing return you over the life of the project? So if we've got a project that we hold for three or four years, well, let's say it produced 7% returns along the way, but then, you know, you put in hundred K and you get seven grand a year in, in distributions, but then you get 45 K on the back end plus your initial investment. Well, it wasn't one smooth uh, return every year because there's a big lump sum on the back end. But when you take all your returns that you got over the life of the project, 
and divide it by how many years, what was the average over the life cycle? So that's what average annualized return is. So if you're looking at a project with a 15% average annualized return, you're not going to see 15% year one, 15% year two. You might see lower, right? 7%, 8% along the way. And then a big lump sum at the back end when you get your capital return. And the over the life of the project, that's what you're looking for is the, you know, what did it average? Even though you're not getting that average every single year over the life cycle of the project, what did it average? And then ROI, um, this can be thought of a, a lot of times like an equity multiple. So what was your ROI? If you put in $100,000 in a project, and you got back one hundred and fifty thousand dollars, then you got you got that fifty percent return, right? That fifty percent ROI. You got your money back plus fifty percent, so that would be fifty percent ROI. Um, if you doubled your money, you'd be a hundred percent ROI, right? Return on your investment. So that's a great question there. Thank you. Perfect. All right. So we have. I'm just going to combine two questions here. Sure. Um, for different people. <laughs> so how long are most of the investments at a time at a times two? And then what is the average life cycle you're seeing on properties? Yeah. So we, like a lot of firms that do what we do, we pretty much always underwrite a five-year hold time. So we don't want to set the expectation that we're going to go in, make improvements and sell it in 12 months. Uh, you know, it could happen. And we've sold deals in, in, in as few as two years. Um, but really most of the time going in, we set an expectation of five years. And, and the reason is you want some time to go in make some improvements and then enjoy some cash flow and appreciation along the way. And then look, if it gets to year four and there's a big market correction, it's not a good time to sell. You're in a position to be able to just wait another year or whatever the case is if you have to. So there's some flexibility there, but our firm and a lot of uh, multifamily operators are going to say, Hey, this is a typically a kind of a five year target window. And that's very common. Okay. Okay. Um, so I like this one. Please discuss the typical LTV and lenders. Yep. So LTV stands for loan to value. If an apartment complex is worth $10 million and they loan you $7 million, a little quick math, $7, 7 million divided by $10 million, you got a 70% loan to value. Uh, the, the kind of right in the middle is, is about 75% loan to value. Kind of similar to a house. You know, if you if you go buy a house, they're going to want to see... 20% down or more. Well, same thing with apartment complexes. They're usually looking for 25% down as a, as a starting point. So loan to value would be 75%. Sometimes it's a little bit lower, 70%. Sometimes it's in the high 70s, but that 75% is a very common uh, loan to value. And then the lenders, this is really special about multifamily, especially the big stuff. These loans are backed by Freddie uh, Mac and Fannie Mae, right? These are government backed loans and they're really attractive terms, very fantastic rates, great terms. And uh, that lets us go, go do these deals. They're also non-recourse, right? So the, the sponsors are not personally liable for the, for the debt, which makes it very attractive. And look, the federal government knows this. The federal government does not want to be in the business of managing tens of thousands or hundreds of thousands of apartment units. They're going to let the private sector do that. Entrepreneurs like our firm, right? So they give us the short, the short version of that is they give us really good loan terms so that we can go out and, and buy these things and provide clean, affordable housing for a large number of people. Good deal. Um, I have one from George that says, does the equity multiple include the overall return and cash flow, or is it in addition to those? It's everything. Everything all together is rolled into that equity multiple. Great question. All right. Um, Let's see. Brian Adams asks, so what ratio of accredited to sophisticated investors do most of your projects require per the private placement? There's not necessarily a ratio, but if we're doing a, a 506B offering, which is, an, is something the Securities Exchange Commission set up, they're dictating that we cannot have more than 35 non-accredited investors. So that's really kind of our only, our only guideline there. If it's a 506B deal, then you can't have more than 35 non-accredited investors. Otherwise, you know, we could have a deal with 35 non-accredited investors and one accredited investor wouldn't matter. The, the way it shakes out, probably most of our investors are accredited, but we like to do 506B projects because we've got some non-accredited investors we've got relationships with. They're able to participate in the project as well, which is great. They're not locked out of it. They don't have to be accredited. Uh, but, I, you know, if we were to look at any given project, we're probably... Uh, 60, 70% accredited investors. Okay. 
Um, okay. And for uh, Fred actually asks for multifamily property acquisition opportunities. Is there a minimum equity amount when a deal has to be syndicated or can one or two large equity investors provide 100% of the equity portion and avoid syndication? Yeah, that's, that's perfectly fine. You know, you could have a, let's say you've got a $10 million deal with $3 million in equity. That 3 million could be one partner. It could be two partners and probably be better I'm not an attorney, but it, from my experience, it'd probably be better to just form a partnership there and not do a syndication. A syndication costs a little bit of money, right? You, there's some attorney costs and things like that. So a syndication typically makes sense for a bigger project where you've got you know millions of dollars coming in and maybe a large number of investors. But sure, if you've got a couple uh, or one investor that just wants to partner with a sponsor and say, hey, I'm going to provide all the equity, that kind of makes it simple for all parties. The challenge is for the sponsor, let's say I'm going to go do a deal and I need 3 million equity. I'm going to put in 300,000 of my own money and I, I, I'm going to have one partner do the rest. That partner better be able to deliver because if I'm counting on them to close a deal and I get to the closing table and that partner can't um, do it, then, then you're, you're in a bind. So that's the challenge with, have, with having one big check writer, which is why you see a lot of sponsors go out and do, and do a syndication with multiple investors. Okay. Um, speaking of sponsors, so we, we've gotten this particular question a lot. Um, what is the minimum investment for sponsors? Great question. So I, I just want to clarify something there. That means what the sponsor is investing in the deal themselves, right? So a typical investor minimum, oftentimes 50K, some projects 100K, it just depends on the deal, but 50K is pretty common. Now, as I understand that question is, what about the sponsor? What are they putting in the deal? Well, a lot of times, well, all the time, the lender requires at least five or 10% of the equity in the deal. So the sponsor's got to put in several hundred thousand dollars in the project just for the lender. The lender's going to want to see that. So that's pretty, uh, that's pretty common to, to do that, uh, to put in at least five or 10% of the equity from the sponsor. Great question. Because you want to make sure the sponsor's got some skin in the game that they're investing in that deal as well um, so that interests are aligned. Perfect. All right. And then, um, guys, uh, if you still have questions, make sure you put them in the, um, in the Q&A section um, that you want to ask Devin. I do have this last one. Is, do you use a property management company? What if an investor brings cash and property management experience? Would that be acceptable or possibly a conflict of interest? Right. It's not a conflict of interest if it's spelled out. It, it could be, right? But you, as long as you disclose it, then you can do that sort of thing. Um, for our firm, we own our, we started our own management company to have better control. We're, we're what's called vertically integrated, meaning we have the investment company, but we also own the management company that helps us be more efficient. Um, so our firm is not looking for management services, but sure, th there could certainly be a case where a partnership you know, brings together a couple of folks that have different skill sets and that are big turnaround projects where, Hey, it might be six months or a year until we start sending distributions, but we're going to say that right up front. So you're going to know right up front when you can expect those, um, when you can expect those distributions. And then last question, is there a set cap rate I can use in analyzing class C apartment deals? Um, and he asked, is it still 10% in Houston? Yeah, I would, uh, John, I would find some brokers in Houston and that's going to be your best resource. I'm in San Antonio. I'm not as familiar with Houston. I don't think it's 10%. That sounds pretty high, but I'm not a Houston guy, but your brokers in that market are going to be your resource. Absolutely. For that, for that type of information. All right. So I'm going to put your contact information in the chat. Okay. So guys, we had a, a we have a lot of questions still going on, but uh, I think these definitely would be best like contacting Devin and uh, D DJE directly um, for this. So you give them a call, you know, uh, there's a lot of talk about like membership fees and stuff like that too. And just um, that kind of thing. Um, so Devin, thank you so much for this presentation. You really stirred up a lot of buzz with like, all these questions. We had like Good. 100 questions. That's the um, fun part. Oh, I love, I love the Q and a part. Um, yep. But guys, um, so make sure you contact Devin. Um, to Make sure if you have it also too, you can um, partner your Coverdell education savings accounts with your IRAs too for these investments. So make sure you open up those Coverdells with the gift ESA coupon code.
get that activity book for your child, start an education savings account for them, start paying for their education completely tax free. No sense in doing it out of pocket if you don't have to. Um, so again, guys, thank you so much for joining us for Self-Directed IRA Saturday this Saturday. I hope you had a wonderful Thanksgiving, wonderful and safe, and we will see you soon. So again, let us know if you have any questions, 855-FUN-IRAs. And thank you, Devin, for joining me today. This is a lot of fun. Thanks for having me on, Nicole. Of course. All right. Bye, guys.